Okay, and welcome back, hour number three. It's Monday, you know what that means. We do our once-a-week effort, we make our once-a-week effort to inform you about the greatest cataclysm, catastrophe, calamity in recorded history. I kid you not, and that is Fukushima Daiichi and the death of the entire North Pacific Ocean and the beginning of the death of the West Coast both in the water and on the shore. It doesn't stop at the sand where the sand ends. Trust me. If you get down near the beach and you smell that, they call it the smell of the salty ocean, marine air, whatever. Uh, It will have extra gifts in the air now for you, little particulates, little tiny parcels of radioactivity we call radionuclides. Not a good sight. And uh, if you've been following the middle column at Rents, looking at the top, you will have seen the stories, primarily from ENE News, they're an aggregator, about the massive, and I mean enormous, die-off of sea life uh, from the bottom of the food chain to the top of the food chain. Doesn't matter. The top of the food chain being the most dramatic and graphic, of course. Now the entire state of Oregon has instituted an unprecedented banning of fishing along the coast and any rivers or streams that go into the ocean from the inland mountains. And I I would suspect there may be even further areas that they have banned as well. Why? Because the fish have been dying in Uh, uncountable, incalculable numbers. Why have they been dying? Well, if you listen to the scientists and read those funny stories, funny in the sense to watch all these people scared of their own shadows, afraid to say the R word, they say, demoic acid. No, no, virus. No, no, climate change. No, no, and then they go on and on. It's it's uh, radiation, folks. Over 200 different radionuclides from Fukushima Daiichi being dumped into the Pacific Ocean right this very moment as I speak to you and as you listen to me. Around the clock, we're heading up onto our, I guess it's our fifth year in March, which will be here before you know it. There's no end of it. There's nothing they can do. There's no technology that is known. I, I want to extrapolate on that a little bit. When I say known, I mean known to us. They may have technology that they could use that they're not going to unveil for reasons that have to do with national security, national defense. I don't have an answer for that. But as far as I know, we have no technology to even begin to address the issue. Back with us tonight, as is always the case when he can make it, which is most all the time, he's been with us all these years, is uh, Yoichi Shimatsu, former weekend editor of the Japan Times, one of the world's truly great environmental journalists and reporters and activists. He's a remarkable man, a friend of mine, a friend of yours, and uh, we owe him a great debt of gratitude for putting his life on the line and making all those trips by himself in most cases, in many cases, to Fukushima Daiichi to check it out, to take a look. Hello, Yochi, welcome back. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, that was a nice introduction. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, a long haul. Uh, Fukushima dangerous as ever. More dangerous in some ways by the water side there, with the rising levels of, uh, you know, yes. by, you know exponential amounts uh, of concentration in the water there. So, basically... You know, they've opened Highway 6 and people drive through there, but I think it's pretty inadvisable at this point for people to be commuting back and forth. I mean, we really don't know. The number of workers and local residents who died are people who have been assigned to work there because, um, you know, we've seen the highest number of deaths in Japan for four and seven consecutive years in a row, you know, breaking the record every time. So, right. obviously, it's uh, the cause of death has got to be linked with Fukushima because everything else is sort of like every other threat uh, in the environmental health in Japan has actually gone down quite radically. So, right. so this is the one factor that's down. Same thing in the oceans, you know, the North Pacific Oceans. 
You know, we don't know. There was that huge oil spill in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, of course, but we haven't seen anything since the Exxon Valdez, you know, incident uh, in the North Pacific. And, uh, you know, the casualties that from that were, you know, right. that, a lot of that oil was in fact collected. It was a tanker, so a lot of it was co- collected and pumped out. So, uh, you know, the death rate there is obviously uh, affects on uh, sea mammals, on fish, and so on. There's uh, really tremendously declined. There's Hanford, but the, the California current would push that water further to the south. Mm-hmm. So without uh, a, a factor like radiation, it will be an inexplicable. Now, these newest reports are of young salmon dying, which is very unusual because, you know, it's older salmon who breed. And after they lay their eggs, uh, you know, they milk and lay their eggs upstream, that's mm-hmm. when they die off. And you can see them, you know, the... the uh, the decay in their flesh is sort of well, white fat coming out of their skins. But these salmons have what look like uh, melanoma-type uh, lesions on their skins, very much like on the older people, the older farmers and fishermen I saw uh-huh. in Fukushima after uh-huh. about a year. Many, many have these skin lesions. Now, some... Uh, so the marine biologists suggest that, well, this is a bacteria infection. Now, was this a chicken or the egg here? You know, in other words, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> the salmon would have scales, they have the slime on their skin, which is very antibacterial. So therefore, it would be very difficult for bacteria to open more than one uh, lesion on one fish. You know, maybe the gill area might be able to kill it, but they have like a half a dozen lesions would mean that, in fact, the fish died from other reasons, and then the bacteria opportunistically start to feed on those open sores. See? So I think that's the more... That's what bacteria do. Cause I agree. I, that's exactly, exactly that's right. That's point. Yeah, super bacteria. You see that in hospitals. You see this in hospitals. You have a lot of lesions from something in hospitals, a lot you know, places where you surgery yep. the bacteria will focus on those areas, right? Yep. So it's very unlikely that a fish would be killed in six different, you know, spots by the bacteria, you know, or dozen spots by bacteria. So, you know, it's like well, some of this stuff is just so fundamental, so basic, basic, like, you know, you know, you know, in the uh, medical, let's say, if we were to compare it to a human medicine, this would be something that interns and ambulance drivers would understand. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to be a neurosurgeon to understand this. And so, therefore, I think the marine biologists, are allowing the wool to be pulled over their eyes, or are just deliberately lying like this fellow? I think it's a combination. Yoshi, it's a combination. Yeah. They know. They know. They're not stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so obviously, we would like to have some scientific truth. Now, the problem is, what this suggests is that science is corrupted, and one of the problems is science is. Uh, I don't think anywhere on the planet is science more corrupted than in Japan. You know, for the last, what, four decades, Japanese whaling fleets have been going down to the South Pacific, right, to yep. the Antarctic waters, yep. to collect data, they say, to do scientific studies on whales. Now when we see this kill-off of whales going on, and much closer to home in the North Pacific, on species that are much more familiar to the Japanese, to whales who will migrate across the Pacific, or across the Bering Sea, down to Japan and the West Coast, and you know, there is some migration of some of those whales, mm-hmm. certainly... Why has not a single Japanese cetologist, a whale expert, okay? Why has not a single one come over to Alaska, okay, or to Washington, to California, to examine the whales? Why hasn't the whaling industry volunteered its know-how, you know, the ability to take a part of whale and conduct the top seat? Right. Why has none of this happened? If they want to do the PR, that's what they do. Is to do a public demonstration, wrap up, and, and where if I can read and help the people of North America comprehend what kind of disease is affecting the marine mammals on the Western diseases, which in fact might a mess in that human, you know, human relation, you know, that lives along the seaboard there. So, you know, they would more deal with uh, marine mammal issues. And if they have such a wonderful scientific effect on which billions of dollars have been spent over the last four days, and, you know, a dozen ships involved, hundreds of crew members and scientists involved, big labs in Japan, where are they now? You know, this is a question. You know, I mean, we have to ask the obvious. And this has been a claim consistently 40 years to the International Building Conference. And I'm not an opponent of it. I'm not speaking of a 
you know, anti-whaling activists. Far from it. Yeah, I think there is a legitimate role for whaling, but it has to prove it. It has to prove its legitimacy. In other words, uh, yeah, if there is legitimate course. whaling, you I, I, get the yeah. point I'm saying. If, if, of if, course, I get yeah, the point. If it yeah. is legitimate, okay, then put your cards on there. Show your legitimacy to no, us they won't and cut do that it. heart open and put a dosimeter to that heart. And let's mm-hmm. see what the results are. Where are the scientists? Okay? The yeah, where are the real scientists? Science. Why do we need them? I mean, now they're, they're no better than a witch doctor. In fact, there's probably witch doctors who would do a better job. You know? I and think they, you're right. Some sort of massive yeah, yeah. We, or the scientists, or, you know, where are they? Yeah, we got uh, a special guest with us tonight, a gentleman who was with us many times during uh, what has yeah. to be in all seriousness, one of the most heroic things that I've heard about in many, many years. Uh, he took off on a, a 20-foot rubber boat and ended up doing most all of it by himself, all the way up to British Columbia coast, going in and out of the, the thousands, what, 30,000 islands? I don't know how many. Checking the tide pools on the islands, on the shoreline, looking for signs of life. And very little did he find. Uh, his name is Dana Durnford. He's back with us tonight. He was on a radio program last hour. He's very busy, and I'm I'm very happy that, uh, at least I hope, he's getting some of the recognition he deserves for what he did up there. Are you there, Dana? Hi, Jeff. Thank you, my friend. Yes, and the same for you guys. You guys don't stop, too, you know. And it's just a small handful of us out there really just really pushing with everything we got. And with the venues we got, right? Um, yeah. I just got back from the other expedition. Oh, Yoshi, I just got back from the Ford expedition up the coastline. Uh-huh. And this was a 10-day or 8-day trip in the summertime now. So, yeah. Right? A lot yeah. of the opposition has been saying, oh, Danny, you know, there's nothing during the wintertime. Of course, I dove the coastline for over, you know, almost a decade and a half straight on this coastline, but I also do the Atlantic coastline, uh-huh. and I, I know the coastline, so yeah, yeah. now it's summertime, and there's still nothing there. Nothing. And so okay, nothing now, you, now you, that's, that's Dana's fourth trip, and an eight to ten day trip, and he went up looking for life in the tide pools. Keep in mind that the tide pools of the British Columbia coast, world famous, world renowned for the life, uh, the diversity, the thousands and thousands and thousands of species of flora and fauna. And what did you see, Dana? Altogether, 10 species. God. And so they were very thin. And so there should be, say, 600 algae in the tidal pools, folks. And that's, uh, that's by that being missed, that's the harbinger that the ocean is no longer sustainable on its own. And the whales that are dying, they, I, I researched that heavily, they eat krill. And krill can have up to a 10-year life. And krill is like a big shrimp, folks, up to two inches. And so the reason they're dying is they're emaciated. The reason, and like the baby seals and sea lions down off California that are dying, most of them are dependent. And there are certain breed of sea lions and seals down there that were dying. And when you look at them, they also depended upon the krill, too. And the herring is missing from the Pacific Ocean. Herring's Ocean gone. Ocean. They're gone. They're I read gone. the story. Yeah. I ran the story. Yeah, they're gone. They do so. And so they're gone now. They're, they're the feeder for many of the migratory birds, the migratory animals, the actual migratory. They all travel together, and so they all. Feed well, it's off chopping each like other. it's like chopping a leg yeah, off of a, a four-legged yeah. table. Uh, the it's herring are really gone. Nothing. Yeah, and the, then the krill are down to nothing because we were able to see all the way to the ocean floor during. Uh, the period of the year, because we like you said, we don't have anybody not familiar. We've done 160 days straight, and so we encompass that period, a transition of where the migratory animals will come through with all the krill, and where you can't see any couple of feet below your. your You're not ocean. supposed to be able to see the ocean right. floor, right? And and our underwater footage clearly perfect shots of the ocean floor. And of course, once you look at the ocean floor up in Mother Nature in the middle of nowhere in that 26,000 island archipelago, we didn't see any shells, a shellfish on the ocean floor, which is just insane. And the rocks got algae on them instead of mussels. I'm not meant. There's only like six species in any one spot instead of 600. But that was significant. Not to see no scallop shells, no abalone shells, uh. no. Um, oyster shells, none of the clam, different types of clam shells, the horse and, and the little necks and the manilas and the razorback clam shells. These are white shells uh, and sort of very visible, extremely visible, especially, you know, 
during that period when there was nothing there and there's supposed to be a soup of life and you shouldn't be able to see down to it. And so there was nothing there for anything to migratory with and there was nothing on the ocean floor. And so the mussel shells, folks, every rock in this coastline was covered in mussels and the inside of the mussel shells are, are very reflective white. And so they would dominate everything anyway. And and so we have an extinction event already and now we're seeing life trying to cling on, not coming back, but trying to cling on. And as you guys covered many times, uh, with so much uh, detail, now we have a real detailed picture of it. I've been uploading the pictures steadily uh, at the site since I got back, and I'm only putting 200 pictures on a page to make sure everybody can access it. Wow. And But it's just a stupid amount of work, and I'm heading out again for the last part of the trip before I do the documentary coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, somewhere in the next week and a half, two weeks, get up and finish it out through the summer. Mm-hmm. And what we're going to see, of course, is no insects, Jeff, the whole time we're up there, except for this one little species. But uh, we never got, we, we camped on shore, never got bothered, never had no bites. That's really? like in an archipelago of islands in the middle of nowhere, uh-huh. Uh-huh. 300 miles up the coastline in Canada, and never got bugged by an insect. Is That was eerie stuff, you know. So and it's and just no the same as it was COVID. last year, but even more so. It's worse. It's worse. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's desperate at this stage. Obviously, is one of well. It's a, we're, look, look what we're looking uh, at uh, is uh, is conclusively the yeah. end of the North Pacific, maybe the whole Pacific Ocean over most, time. Most likely, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's true. Now here's Dana's website. You can get to by clicking on his name. It's entitled the Nuclear. Proctologist.org. All right. Oh, right. The nuclear and proctologist.org. You can see untold numbers of, of photos of tide pools, which ought to be just glistening with varieties of, of life. Yeah, There's nothing there. There's nothing yeah, there. Should be amazing. And the way uh, the, the seals, I was able to get right up to the seals within a couple of feet of the seals. Oh, they're weak. And they're and they're so weak, and, and they're not in very good shape at all. And I got those pictures up there. I mean, that haunted me. Uh, I had to leave that little area within after I finished the, the pictures. I just Once I got that close to it, and they still didn't take off, because that's what they would do. When you yeah. get within a couple hundred feet, they're normally in the water. Yeah. And they would get right up to it, and they were uh, this babies is there. It's heartbreaking. Uh, it is, because that's the very few that you do see, and they're decimated on top of that. The whole, the whole thing so far, uh, I don't, you know, to be exposed to it all day, be out there and seeing it all day, and just racking your brains of why ain't the academics doing this, and why ain't, you know, it's always, even though I know better, I still have to ask myself those questions, because that's, that's just the, the way... Well, you, you know, a part of it is, we're, we're, we're all human beings, and you say to yourself, how can these people, as professional scientists... Hide, yes. obfuscate, and um, lie like this. Yes. Or, or let's or, give them the benefit or, of the doubt. How can they not ask the obvious questions? Could radiation have something to do with it? They don't even do that. Very so it's all a fix. Oh, it's it's disgusting. Oh. Now, the Oregon problem, I'm going to do just a little bit on this. We ran a couple of days of stories on that. Restricting fishing in Oregon streams and rivers for the first time ever. So you tourists who are heading oh. up to Oregon to go fishing for okay. salmon and steelhead. Let me cut you off, Jeff. Go Let ahead. Let me cut you off. Yeah. Now, this, is, this, this folks, is, this is staggering. What I'm going to tell everybody right now is that there's no snow in any of the mountains in British Columbia. And uh, people probably don't understand why that sounds so serious. Because I do. Yeah, That's if, you, a if shock. you understand that the British Columbia, it's always snow in the mountains all year, every year, in the hottest day of the year, just up from your town, all these mountains are full of snow right at the top. And you always feel that you can go up and go skiing. You always feel you can go up with a skidoo and go on the skidoo all day long and then come mm-hmm. down and get your shorts back on and drive down the hill and go swim in the lake and play on the beach. And But you can't do that. That's missing. That is like, I think to myself, you know, that is, wow, that is inconceivable. As much as the death of the Pacific Ocean, that is, that is really, that is what's happening now. So there's no water coming down the mountains. I know everybody around me because I'm 10 miles outside of town. Their wells are dry, and we're just starting in the summer. And so this is 
we're going to run out of water down Their here. Their wells are dried up. Wells the groundwater is gone. That's amazing. That's yeah, truly amazing. We've, we've never seen this. Ever. Well, we've, and uh, no one's mentioned it. No one's talked about it. No one's even no, brought it no. up. No, no. Well, what this um, is, 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 you know, in a, in a way, you could be facetious about it. We're going to go through the break, uh, Todd. Uh, this is really climate change <laughs> in oh, the bigger yeah. sense of the word. Everything has changed. All bets are off. Oh no more snow. Groundwater disappearing. The top of the species in the ocean, the top of the food chain, dying miserable deaths, horrible deaths. The herring is gone, ladies and gentlemen. You you could count probably trillions of herring, and they're gone. They're gone. Inconceivable. And you can see the bottom of the ocean because there's no organic activity going on in the water like there should be to cloud it up. You can see no straight insects. through. No insects yeah, no on the windshields of the cars. Yeah. No birds exactly. either. No right. birds either. It's down, like you say, one millionth of a percent. I used to say one tenth of a percent of a percent. Now I'm saying one millionth of a percent. No birds. The gallows laugh, folks. Yeah, there's nothing. I mean, there's, you probably... To the whole coastline, you might count a thousand, fifteen hundred. Um, Unbelievable. That that would only be three species. And what was interesting about this trip here was this time in particular, um, there was hardly any seagulls whatsoever. Well, there won't and be so any in another year or two. There won't yeah, be so any there was at some all. Cormorants and there was um, some puffins, but um, and some, some snowbirds. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, there was uh, a couple of tickle asses. There was uh, probably five species of birds altogether, and yeah. of 169 migratory and 147 residential. We're going to go through and, the and break, Todd. Thank you. Uh, and so let altogether, me... that, that's uh, just one quick one was that for anybody that's listen, that's around 12 species in nine months that we identified on the coastline of all those species. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Okay, last little bit on this, and we'll go right back to Yochi. Uh, the Oregon situation is... For some, well, the North Pacific Current comes across almost directly from Fukushima, yes. and it splits in half off Oregon and Washington, and it's piling up most densely as the southern part of that split moves down the coast. Oregon is getting blasted. Um, the, the Japanese current warms the water right from Alaska right down through the archipelagos in Canada. That's confirmed now. Yeah. I dug that data up. Did, yeah, no. wow. So the water directly comes in and slams into the whole coastline. Yeah. Wow. It warms okay. up the coastlines, maintained year long. There you go. Because of that warm current. So that is really significant. They hid that away from us too, see? Yeah. Okay. I couldn't get here. They said, oh, it's too far away to get here. But it's, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I'm trying to get as much out as we can this hour. Uh, mail, the Mail Tribune, Oregon, July 16th. Emergency fishing closures go statewide. The spokesman reviewed July 17th. Washington Fish and Wildlife Department officials are enacting fishing restrictions to Washington. Over 38 rivers. Emergency rules take effect on Saturday. There's a picture of a fish here with those horrible lesions that Yochi was describing he had seen on human beings over in Japan before. Uh, Fisheries biologist Rod French says dead salmon appeared to have been infected with a gill rot disease. Do you hear the word radiation here? No. French said it appears the fish are dying from a bacterial infection. Do you hear radiation there? No. Yochi, how long can they keep lying? Finish. I mean, you know, the fish are disappearing, and then they don't have to lie anymore. There you uh, go. Then they move on. They Perfect on answer. This is a problem. Yeah, this is a problem. And how can it be gill rot? The fish come by the gill. They will not have all these lesions on their bodies, you know, down to their tail. So it makes no sense at all. They're trying to, to call it bacterial infection. And it is so obscene. Yeah. The lying going on. And I again ask you, dear ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are on this planet, uh, I'll ask you in an overt sense, how many news conferences have you heard the U.S. EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, hold about radiation in the North Pacific waters that come up and slam against the the, the West Coast. None. Not one word. Not one news conference. Uh, Yochi, the idea that the Pacific Ocean is going to recover from this is is uh, a black, ugly laugh. 
But yeah, it's just ludicrous. Uh, there, there is just uh, no way radiation levels are rising off Fukushima. In two years, they're going to be subsequently then rising off the coast of North America, you know, in the northern Pacific. As far as I can tell, a lot of the water, as we discussed last week, is circulating back toward Asia, given kind of uh, these strange line of storms across the uh, uh, Tropic of Cancer. So this is a, a, a mega event. There's no coming back. And consider the importance of the fishing industry for, to the economies of the states of Alaska. Oh, they're, they're uh, over. Washington, we Oregon. predicted this Wiped four away. years ago. Whole coast of communities undercut. Yeah. Undercut. Gone. They're gone. No, they're gone. They're gone. Well, they're they're, they're yeah, never come back. Them, yeah? yeah, they're not going to come back. Yeah. Well, they're, they're not going to. Well, Alaska was still going strong. They're, they're, I think they're basically finished now. And the, and the other problem that Dana mentioned was the snowpack is gone. And the snowpack is important for a couple of reasons. One is that that's the, basically the supply of water in the spring and summer. Why the water table uh, is falling is because all the snow just turns to liquid water, rushes down to the ocean or evaporates. The second problem uh, has to do with, you know, snow is reflective. It creates a high pressure zone above it which tends to stabilize weather patterns. Now, that you, when the snow over Canada and the North Pacific is gone, or the uh, Pacific Northwest is gone, you're going to have weather instability, as the United States has been seeing since the year 2012, a year after Fukushima. You're seeing massive instability, you know, extreme cold, lots of wind, strange weather, you know, phenomena, tornadoes, and so on. Massive problem. Now, I've suggested the reason the snow is gone is not because of higher temperatures, because it was a very cold winter. It is because of tritium mixed into the water. You know, it's indistinguishable from water, and it's breaking down mm -hmm. the ability of water to crystallize. So this is a massive problem in that not only does everything go crazy up there, and there's huge volatility in the weather over North, North America and the Arctic, but also the fact that tritium is coming into the drinking water, okay? There's tritium in the drinking water. Big problems uh, really surfacing now. And I predicted, I think, was it like a year, or less than a year after Fukushima, I said there's a very likely chance that of desertification, that all of Scandinavia you, you will certainly become did. a desert. Because yes. Of, yes. Yes, I did. Little yeah. did I expect at that time it would have such a huge impact on the Canadian Rockies and on the Pacific Coast Range, and it's happening there too. So I Good. expected a lot of them to be yeah. moved across the Arctic, destroy the Arctic, land in Scandinavia, cause a crisis there. Little did we know is that so much of it also, you know, uh, and it's very unclear why the tritium is coming down. It has to do with wind currents and all that. And I suppose the jet stream did not expect. This massive loss of uh, snowpack in North America. This is a bit shocking. It doesn't matter. It's kind of maybe a relatively small area. Okay. But North America, to lose that much snow, that is like a mega, you know, mega event. Yeah, let me do something else. I'm going to switch gears here. This is important. Uh, Yochi will have direct uh, data on this. Uh, certainly, Dana will have uh, something too. This is important. I talked to a, a gentleman on the phone today for quite some time. Okay. And he revealed some things to me that you, Yochi, probably know about. It has to do with the black fungus, the black mold in Japan. Now, this was first talked about in October of 2011 in a newspaper report then, this weird black stuff they were finding. And then hot spots around Tokyo, they identified and admitted to 20 radioactive hot spots. He said he had some friends who were in the mining business who had their counters with them, their Geiger counters, and they went out for walks. And they had them set so that an alarm would go off if they were in a, a mortal or a danger zone that could kill you if you were to hang around it long enough, okay? Like even an hour or less. There were some of them that were that intense. This radioactive black fungus in Japan is blowing back to the United States. This is what a newspaper last uh, 2013 said. The Australian e, e News contributor has analyzed a sample of black fungus that originated in uh, uh, Minamim... What is it? Minamisoma. 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 Yeah, right. 
right now. Okay. I'm not Fukushima. I'm just right uh, there on the planet. Yeah. Okay. He said, I was sent this resin encapsulated sample of black fungus-like material. It has reportedly come from somewhere in that area. A contact in Japan sent the sample to a friend. This is a test chart for it. For those of you who have not looked at a scintillator test chart like this before, the position of the peaks, blah, 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 blah. The black fungus started growing on the concrete and rock surfaces in Japan after Fukushima. It then showed up where? On the asphalt roadways of Japan, especially on the outer edges where the car wheels didn't go and chew it up. It grew yeah. there. Why yeah. was it there on the asphalt? What's in asphalt? You got to think about this. Petroleum, yeah. oil is in asphalt. Yeah. This radioactive yeah. material, whatever the isotope is, feeds on the petroleum. Now, I'm told also yeah. by another source, I don't want to get into too much detail, but that at night, Yochi, they're going around on these mm-hmm. asphalt roads, digging many of them up and repaving them overnight while the people are asleep. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is absolutely. I've been uh, reporting that for the second year. Uh, there's a brand new road that were paved right over. That's uh, right. Right over. They, uh, dust, radioactive dust gets on the ground, and then this uh, black mildew or black fungus begins to develop there and concentrate. So you get hot sauce, so they try to cover it up. And there is radioactive material on that well, called fish plant, you know. There are very low concentrations of uh, uranic compounds in asphalt. And that's why the that's why these uh uh uh, 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 uh microorganisms are able to feed on these but see, you know, also the other thing is you gotta remember you salt the roads in the winter, okay, you salt them for icing. And mm-hmm. so they have a high tolerance of salt. Hmm. They'll feed, they'll draw energy from the pitch blend in the asphalt. And so radiation, you know, in precipitation is a boom for these things. You know, this is like a prime feeding time. And so they're growing like crazy. Yeah. And, you know, as we know, spores do travel. Spores do travel. From yes, August, it, they uh, sure do. Well, you know, yep. and, and moisture precipitation coming across the Pacific. And the Pacific Coast are relatively warm. You know, they're, they're caused by these typhoons coming from the uh, mid-Pacific area. So these are pretty warm currents that they're traveling. So no problem with survival in getting over to North America. So it's a real threat. And, you know, cause North America, ideal conditions, you got those asphalt roads, you got the salting of the roads. They don't uh, just grow on asphalt, by the way. That's their natural no. starting point. Concrete. Uh, you see them, uh, you see them you, yeah, on concrete, and you see them in the, what you call cement between bricks, as we know, that's pretty strong mortar. cement. It, it's alkaline, should kill them. Yeah, the mortar. The mortar between bricks. They're growing there. I see them growing there. So it means they're highly adaptable, and uh, they would not normally grow in the mortar, but the fact of regulation in the environment, maybe like salt. It's just like uh, wow. the machine is delivering food to these, uh, to these, uh, you know, very horrible plants. Okay. And, you know, but, uh, yeah. Let me get over to uh, Dana now, Yochi. That's uh, Yochi has been talking about the roads and this black stuff. We've been doing it for four and a half years now. Uh, it was seen relatively soon thereafter, as I said, reported in a newspaper in October uh, of that first year, two uh, three eleven. Um, okay. Now, before before you comment, Dana, let me say one thing. The normal uh, CPM counts per minute in in my home is 26 to 30. That's normal. I went over to the replaceable filter on my return air duct on my home HVAC system. Right? Okay, you folks know what I'm talking about. You got to replace those filters on your air intakes on your your house. Uh, air conditioning and heating systems. I went over there with the counter after reading 26 and put it up there. It was 128 to 130 on the filter. That's it, just sucking it in. It's coming in through the windows and it's going into the filter and getting stuck. I very carefully picked it up, threw it in the trash, got another one. It's going to be the same thing again next time. It was last time. So this is another problem, folks. You've got to replace those filters, please. 
uh, get yourself a HEPA filter for the home itself. And uh, don't get the kind with the washable filters. You want to get the kind with the disposable filters. So you put it in plastic, throw it away. Go ahead, Dana. Uh, the tritium in Canada for the drinking water standards is uh, 7 million becquerels a cubic meter of water. It's a bit of size of somebody's hot tub. And uh, just because Yoshi was talking about that, and that's so important that, because what he's saying is verified by drinking water standards in Canada, which is the same as the Americans. We just do whatever the Americans do. And you so, raise the safe levels, right? These safe, safe so-called levels. safe 7 levels. Million becquerels, 7,000 uh, 7, becquerels a liter. Jeez. And they normally do it per cubic meter. And so uh, what people should understand is that the previous uh, Fukushima, the natural radiation in your water was 0.05 of uranium and 0.005 of another one. But now they got 7,000 barrels in a liter. But these were cubic meters for before. Now, now they got things down to a liter because you can't put 7 million barrels of tritium in a liter. But there's also white tritium, too, that's produced at that same time. Uh, and so the black mole, I want to touch on that for Yoshi again, because that's so important, that here in Canada we were talking to the divers uh, at the Queen Charlotte's Archipelos, 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 uh, which is in northern Canada, folks, and the, the black mole, the commercial divers that were harvesting along the coastline were trying, and that's another story I'm going to tell you right away, too, that I just got from the divers, an update that, uh, but anyway, the black mole in the Charlotte, you couldn't, uh, all the product that was left there was pushed up into one corner and everything else was covered with this black mole. And these divers, I've known them for a couple of decades, and, and they make, uh, folks, they make like 50000 bucks an hour. And that frightened them. That They, they want to know, did, did I know anything about that? And I knew about the black mole in Japan, but I was still trying to wrap my mind around just what was going on here. And so I had seen it myself, and I was going to ask them, showing the picture and asking him, but he was blurting away at me. Which he was just total panic about it. Really? Now, I was no. talking to the divers. No. That was in the Charlottes that last trip. Now, I was talking to the divers uh, a week ago up north, and they told me that the industry failed uh, south of where we were too. So the lower end, uh, the south end from central Canada, say, had failed the industry. They couldn't harvest anything. The stuff they did find... It was so thin they couldn't do anything with it. They couldn't. There was no. There was no way to sell it. It was literally rotten. Is how they described it. And they were heading back up north. But that was a shocking revelation that the whole industry had failed. Because thereafter, you know, the sea urchin at that time, and it's much bigger and further up the food chain, and it seemed to be one of the few out there that was hanging on, right? Because I got good documentation from underwater footage, and so that was staggering to see that. But to go back and, and just end it on that was that Yoshi, when he's talking about the tritium, folks, he's not kidding. It's evident in our drinking water standard in North America now. They have raised the limit to 7 million becquerels. That's murder. See, that's murder. If a terrorist was to release that much radioactivity into the community, we would all lose our freedoms and our rights, what's left of it. But instead, they get that. Oh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, okay. Uh, Yoshi's right, Jim. Yeah. yeah. New tests uh, in 2014 showed that plutonium, and I understand that polonium is also coming over here in, in smaller quantities, plutonium reached millions of times its normal levels uh, at the uh, New Mexico WIP site. I mean, we've got problems over here, too, that nobody even talks about. Uh, it just, it's, it's so bad. Yo, Yochi, uh, they understandably are still raising the so-called safe levels in Japan, are they not? Oh, that's how they possibly increase them. The problem is the reporting is not coming through. Our only data on Tokyo is coming from the sewage plant, the yeah, sewage disposal plant. Is the only authority giving us any kind of data. Huh. So it just goes to show they're not basically whatever information they have, they're stuffing it in the black bag and not telling us. Very much a problem. Falsification of data. Now, the National Regulatory uh, Administration, NRA, their agency, excuse me, uh, found that uh, the Chugoku, uh, this is the electrical power company in uh, southwest uh, Honshu, and down on the main island, are they deliberately falsifying their data? Uh, in other words, they're just openly 
you know, uh, rewriting data findings and making fake reports to the regulatory agency. So they're, they're very upset. Now, this, this one plant from Shimane is right next to the Yamaguchi. This is where the constituency of the prime minister, she was lobbying, and he gets a lot of company, uh, uh, campaign contributions from this power company. Uh-huh. So this explains the interconnection between the political class and bureaucracy, the regional power companies, and then the falsification of that. And I'm sure you read how uh, she was consistently falsified. They're kind of at every division and they suffer the financial loss and they suffer as a result of Fukushima. They're uh, looking into the data quality of the uh, Ishikawa prefecture and Okariku power company about the plant they want to reopen right on top of the fall line. So there's just a mass of disinformation coming out of a fit of that sort of or nothing, let's say. Nothing is sort of good because it shows that at least that agency will say nothing rather than deliberately lie. Okay? But that whole science we had for four and a half years, it's ominous. It's ominous, especially in the Tokyo area, where we've got this huge concentration of population of schools, you know, homes and so on. Very, very terrible situation. So we have, and again, the data coming out of Fukushima, mainly from Tokyo Electric Power Company, which has had a history of lying. What's <laughs> really coming out of Fukushima, we still don't know. All we know is whatever they report is shocking the eye, you know, a thousand times higher, you know, than what we report is a little ball estimate. That's all we can conclude based on this whole pattern of disinformation. Yeah, yeah, disinformation. Uh, uh, I would call it uh, accessory to murder lying is what it is. Uh, this is it's just it's, it's just criminal. I, but no one will be held accountable. Rest assured, ladies and gentlemen, don't worry. No one will be put on trial for war crimes. This isn't war in a way, but it's an environmental war. Uh, Dana, go ahead. We don't have a whole lot of time left. Give me another couple of minutes here. Okay. I'll just leave everybody with this one. There's a paper out there from 1971 uh, it's titled Fallout and Reproduction of Ocean Fish Population. Uh-huh. And you'll find a good link at mindfully.org. You can click on that one. That's a safe one. Uh, we examined, and what it does is it showed in 1971 that the fish stocks, like the herring and the trout and the salmon, the eggs, the larvae, the small fries, were mm-hmm. extremely impacted, devastated during... Uh, testing, right? And but after the cessation of it, after during the down, nuclear the testing, was, yeah, after they started to slow it down, they started to see a recovery, and then but the recovery was only thirty percent of pre-nuclear testing. Really? And, uh, yeah, and then uh-huh. the comparisons were done with the fishermen. Uh, they knew how many fishermen were on the ocean, what their tonnages were in the follow patterns that were emitted, and they knew the isotopes that they'd done the studies on, and then they were able to extrapolate the other isotopes, and then they were more worried about these other isotopes We didn't have any data on that. So they were using strontium and cesium as a as a fingerprint for the other ones had to be there too also. And so what it does is shows us is that that, that nuclear testing, which is not in comparison to what happened in Fukushima, because Chernobyl lasted 10 days, was equal to 400 Hiroshima's, and Fukushima is probably equal to at least a half a million at this stage. I would numbers think. Like that. Yeah. Okay, and so I can leave you on that, but that study is worth checking out for everybody, and nobody's really know about that study, I guess. Um, but uh, I got it from a reputable source, and I went through the study a number of times and, uh, and looked up his other stuff, and he's, he's legitimate 100%, so... And we send out hugs for Yoshi and Jeff and uh, try to get everybody to come over here tonight and listen to that radio show because they got to get them over there. Because Yoshi and yourself don't stop. See, when you guys start talking, and I, I shut up for a few minutes, then you guys really nail away at it. And I can only just get You do the same it. thing. Don't, don't underestimate yourself. You're, a, you're <laughs> one of the great heroes of our time. And uh, we're, we're going to keep Thank going. You. All of us, we're going to keep at it. And you're right, there's just a little handful of us. Not, there's a thin line of people who are trying to do the right thing. And, and, and d- damn, we're, we're I'm... We're educating them. You know, we'll, we'll get them every Yeah, time. we're doing our best. Uh, okay, you take uh, care of yourself, Dana. Thank you for yeah, staying up you, late. Uh, we'll good. talk okay. to you again very right. soon. You too, Yoshi. Take care, folks. Good night. Okay. All right. You there, Yoshi? Yeah, we got him. 
uh, I think the spirit of science rides on his little rubber raft. That's all we've got left. What an image. What an image. Hundreds of thousands of scientists across the northern hemisphere and boils down to one fellow on a rubber raft. I mean, the spirit of science, though, the spirit and letter of what science is supposed to be about. Supposed to be here to help mankind deal with these issues, understand nature better, to understand our mistakes better. Rise on one man's shoulders on that little yeah. raft. That's yeah. But we are very happy the weather is turning. It was more light now. What he's talking about is summer there. We're not just talking about temperature. We're talking about sunlight. You know, there should be more light, more photosynthesis among the algae, which feeds the plant. The fact that the photosynthetic process is stopped and life, you know, everything out there is uh, in time for radioactive heat or just dying from starvation. It's a grim, grim statement about our technological civilization. That everything we have trusted and believed in about the wonders of science and how it's going to make life safer and easier for us has proven to be the biggest lie in human history. And there are, are going to be survivors of this. And I seriously wonder if the human species can survive. It's all radioactive garbage and chemical garbage. And you know, we got to remember. We, we got to remember. They're going to be able to continue on. Huh? Yeah. We got to remember one thing. There are over 500 reactors on the pl- on the planet already. Yes. We have been so lucky yes. for so long to have only Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima. We we could get another one tomorrow. We could get two more next week. We're just on borrowed time. It's madness, and they're talking about building I don't know how many new reactors and plants. It's just crazy. The EPA uh, raised. The, what they call their protective action guides, their PAGs. They were obviously put in place to allow safe exposure, to keep the exposure levels low enough to where it was safe to be around some of this stuff. Not from Fukushima, but from years before that. Well, they have revised these, these estimates so radically that the allowable levels, for example, of iodine-131 can be from anywhere from 3,000 to 100,000 times higher than what was considered maximal safety levels, up to 100,000 times higher than what was considered maximum safe exposure. This is your government, folks. Well, you know, one thing is that, you know, when one country puts out a plant and, and then those kinds of very, very leak radioactivity in the waters in the air, they're threatening everyone that lives on the same uh, latitude around the world. And the winds, you know, the storms, Good and point. Of the, uh, the sea currents. Now the problem is right now the tropical of cancer is sort of like that dividing line. The Fukushima crisis basically rides along the tropical of cancer, hits the Philippines and so on. It's circulating around Central America. So along that line, but the problem is they want to put new reactors in the below or south of the tropical of cancer, Vietnam and in India and uh, the Middle East. Absolutely well, that'll take care of the, that'll take care of the whole planet. That'll finish it. Exactly. When you cross that equal, uh, put it close to the equator, basically, uh, that ensures that every environmental zone on this planet is going to be destroyed, and it will move southward into the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and destroy those countries. And uh, the notion that we have a Chernobyl, you know, which has really been devastating for Europe. I mean, people aren't really saying how much radiation. Oh, uh, oh no. Eastern Europe is uh, is pasted with radioactivity. They won't talk about it. Western Europe also. Western Europe, the mountains of Western Europe. You know, they import wild and Frankfurt, I some wild boar there, wild boar soup. The wild, turns out the wild boar comes from Australia. They can't eat their name there anymore. They can't eat mushrooms there anymore. This is a traditional diet. It has to come from the southern hemisphere now. This is how far it's gone in Western Europe. Train stations that are massively radioactive in Germany, okay? Very, very radioactive. From, they're hauling nuclear waste and nuclear bombs on those rail, rail lines going through major towns. Now we have Fukushima. Can the world afford another 
If you're an accident, can the world afford another one? We There's no chance. No. We must roll back. We must stop the nuclear roll of that and check on every nuclear plant while we still have the chances to do that. You got it. You got it. Yoshi, thanks uh, a million for everything, and I'll uh, talk to you next week. Yeah. Yeah, All right. keep up those filter changes. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. All right, we'll get a hopefully a better connection for him next time. Sorry you couldn't understand everything, but I think you got the gist of it. And Dana, uh, so very glad he's home safe. Honestly, I didn't... I was very worried about him. So was Yochi, so were many of you. All right, that's our uh, Fukushima update for you, at least part of it. And it's all at uh, rents.com in the middle column or the nuclearproctologist.org. Tremendous amount of data there. Uh, you can look at, uh, we run ENE News and, and what we can get from Dr. Rich Wilcox in Japan. He'll send stuff over as well. Thank you, Rich. So there we go. All right, that's your little crew working for you. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you tomorrow night.